two, first talk for Terrified Chipmunk track. Um, we've got a good one here. We have Michael Bourne, who I've known for a while. He uh, helps out at DC402, OWASP, uh, and you may not know this, but in a past life, uh, he would do weather, uh, meteorologist. And so I, I don't know if there's any connection here that his talk is about clouds, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. So. Uh, Michael, thanks for being here. He's going to be going over the top 10 tools for cloud penetration testing. Uh, and don't forget, if you guys have questions, post it in the Terrified Chipmunk track on Discord, and I will ask them to Michael for you. All right, Mike, thanks. All right, thanks, Jason. And uh, you took my joke away, but that's okay. Yes, my background in meteorology makes me qualified to talk about clouds. I'm just kidding. Uh, hi, everybody. First of all, I just want to give a big shout out to the Colonel Con OCs for pulling this together as a virtual con last minute. Hats off. Seriously, this has been so enjoyable just to see people interacting on Discord, uh, people engaged in the videos. The talks have been phenomenal so far. Uh, and I also love seeing some of the frustration for some of the uh, CTF challenges. So if you're not part of the CTF, you got to do it. It's a really good one this year. Uh, again, a lot of things kind of got pulled together last minute. So, so hats off. Uh, yes, hi everybody. I'm, I'm Michael Bourne. I work at a company called Secure Sky. Uh, we're a cloud security company. Um, I have a lot of different duties and, and uh, um, uh, wear a lot of hats just because we're a small but mighty startup. I think we're going on year two or three, uh, so we're, we're pretty uh, infants uh, as far as the company goes. But uh, what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, tools um, that I find useful for cloud penetration testing. Um, I called it the top 10 tools. Really, it's Michael's top 10 tools. Uh, I'm not saying or claiming that these are the best tools out there. Uh, these are just the tools that uh, I find uh, very useful. So a little bit about me. I do work at Secure Sky. I perform penetration testing type of consulting services as my primary duties. Uh, my strengths are really in application security, uh, and I'm heavily involved in OWASP, as Jason said, here locally, uh, and I'm a lifetime member of uh, OWASP Global. Um, internal security duties, I share those with uh, my cohort, Wacy Lanier. Uh, we both, again, wear many hats besides just consulting. And uh, we're, we're both uh, drinking from a fire hose daily, but it's a good thing. Uh, previously, I worked at NTT Security. For those that know the history, NTT Security uh, used to be solutionary until NTT Group acquired them. Um, that's right here in Omaha. Uh, Lincoln Financial, there was a brief, brief stint of some application security uh, role there. And then, as Jason mentioned previously, before I decided to fulfill my tech bug, which I've had for a while, uh, I worked as a uh, broadcast meteorologist at various uh, small and mid-market TV stations across the U.S. Uh, that's how I landed here in Omaha. I actually and wound up leading to uh, meeting my wife. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity through PAC Publishing to uh, publish a book on binary analysis. Uh, I decided that uh, there was a pretty big gap in beginner level uh, binary analysis, specifically surrounding uh, learning the ELF um, uh, ELF uh, binary format and uh, assembly in, in uh, uh, Linux for both 32-bit and 64-bit. So I took it as an opportunity to, um, you know, write about that from kind of a beginner approach uh, to share, uh, hopefully help people overcome some of the struggles that I had uh, when taking on the task of, of beginning that avenue of learning as well. Uh, it's been doing pretty well so far. I've been really pleased with the feedback. And so if you've, if you've bought a copy and have read it and have left a comment on either Amazon or PAX website, I, I really appreciate that. All right, so uh, the focus of this talk, we are gonna talk about cloud, uh, but I think it's important to help you understand uh, some of my motivations for, for wanting to give this talk. Um, so we'll cover that, and then we'll try to cover tools that I like to use for specific platform, uh, specifically Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, or AWS in the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, these are what I would consider the three big ones right now. I know uh, I've met some organizations who use Oracle, some who use IBM Cloud, but we're going to stick to these three uh, well-known cloud platforms right now. And then we'll also cover some miscellaneous tools that either I stumbled upon recently uh, and haven't had a chance to use or that I find also using for very specific niche situations when performing assessments, either against modern applications running in cloud environments, multi-cloud uh, security assessments, um, or, uh, or specific tools that, again, fulfill a, a specific role during a, a penetration assessment. 
So let's let's kind of get right to it. Uh, we've probably seen a lot of newsworthy attacks lately within the past year or two. Uh, probably heard of the term business email compromise, uh, abbreviated as BEC, account takeover, uh, maybe some misconfigured services, uh, you know, were the result of, of some attacks and successful breaches um, or uh, applications as, you know, developers are moving to the cloud. There's just some gaps that they're introducing uh, into a cloud environment because they're maybe not sure how to handle the migration to the cloud. Uh, Security Magazine had a great article uh, highlighting some of the bigger ones. I'm sure you recognize some of these uh, companies like Capital One, First American Title, State Farm, DoorDash, and a Facebook app called At The Pool were some of the bigger breaches uh, that occurred according to Security Magazine um, within the past year or two. So this is really kind of leading to my motivation. If you know anything about the cloud, uh, the new perimeter, uh, I'll give you air quotes there, the new perimeter really is identity, uh, meaning usernames, password, one-time pass tokens, if, if multi-factor is enabled. Uh, this is really what's uh, the, the, the new perimeter on, on cloud environments. John Strand, you know, bless his heart, he, he kind of um, <laughs> uh, gave away some of my talk already, but that's okay. He, he, he really reinforced uh, some of my motivations for giving this talk. So with identity as the new perimeter, we've all, uh, those of us who have pen tested or been a part of any sort of information security team or administrative IT team, understand that users just are not good at creating passwords. We just aren't. Uh, look at breach data from LinkedIn, look at um, uh, breach data from uh, Dropbox, right? Uh, we're just not good at creating passwords on our own. Now, thankfully, there's been a lot of advances in technology to help us with that in the form of password managers um, or, uh, you know, various forms of authentication without, you know, requiring your user to, to create or remember a password. And while those are good, they still have their, their, their downsides. Um, next, we also have the shared responsibility model. Now, this one is, is specifically for Microsoft, but Amazon has their own, Google Cloud has their own representation of this. And one thing we notice as we look at this, the blue is representing the customer in this case, it's Microsoft responsibility in terms of security and risk management. I'm gonna highlight an area here because uh, if you look, accounts and access management fall solely on the customer of the cloud service provider, whereas the infrastructure for identity and directory management uh, is mostly the customer and partly the cloud provider's uh, responsibility. Uh, now with that said, keep in mind identity being the new, new perimeter and common attacks against cloud environments uh, revolving around account takeover and business email compromise. Um, now, this by no means should scare you away from the cloud. It just means that do your homework. We have to do our homework when we understand, uh, we have to uh, do our homework and educate ourselves in order to understand uh, some of the new risk uh, factors of migrating to, to cloud environments and specifically around identity and user management. So with that said, Microsoft kind of took care of this problem or that they're trying to. Uh, this year they released their security defaults and made that um, uh, uh, common release. And, and what that means is multi-factor is enabled and enforced by default. And some of the weaker authentication mechanisms such as legacy authentication uh, have been disabled by default. So that's all good. Um, but they're not doing anything really with adjusting how long multi-factor authentication tokens live. And there's a big difference between applications um, and, you know, your, your, uh, your cloud environments, uh, multi-factor authentication tokens. And there's a setting that allows you to save those tokens, essentially trusting the device uh, to maintain that authenticated session uh, for a, a lot longer period of time. And in some cases, if, if you do your research or read the blog on our website, you'll find that the multi-factor authentication, while good, uh, requires a lot more work than just the default settings to use. Now, on top of that, uh, penetration testing needs uh, are changing if they haven't already. Uh, we're seeing a lot of organizations run hybrid environments. So your traditional on-prem uh, Active Directory environment is, is not really the, the de facto for most organizations anymore. Uh, there's some sort of integration with Azure Active Directory if they're an Office 365 client, possible integration with G Suite and Google Identity and Access Management um, and syncing between their on-prem Active Directory and, and 
of the Google Cloud Platform or AWS. Uh, so uh, because these needs are changing, this is why I think it's important to have a talk like this. This is why it's important to adjust our mindset a little bit. Um, John Strand in his keynote yesterday mentioned that, hey, we can eliminate some steps in a pen test. I mean, we, we may be able to do that with a strictly on-prem environment. Uh, you know, we're limited on time. We're doing an internal pen test, go straight for Nmap, go straight for your, uh, your scanning and enumeration. That, that really can't happen anymore, uh, especially because identity is that new perimeter. So the needs have changed, and this is why uh, I was very motivated to put this talk together. So let's break down the platforms uh, right now. Uh, let's start with uh, Azure, uh, Microsoft's platform. Now this will also come uh, cover Office 365. Uh, FYI, I'm just gonna group it all into Azure, but Office 365 uh, is kind of its own separate uh, beast in and of itself. Um, one of the best tools I find is the Azure and the Office 365 uh, PowerShell modules. Now, there is a caveat to this you have to be able to use PowerShell in the environment. Um, if you're familiar with the CIS benchmarks, one of the best practices in the benchmarks is to disable PowerShell use for uh, Azure or to severely limit it. So uh, if, if the account you happen to compromise isn't um, an administrative user with the PowerShell privileges, you may not be able to use PowerShell whatsoever. Uh, so the second tool uh, that I recommend is, is the uh, Azure command line tool. It's really a, a great tool that kind of covers some gaps where the PowerShell modules and commandlets don't cover and allows uh, somewhat intuitive uh, flow uh, at, into your pen testing needs. Now, with that said, all of this assumes that you've already found accounts, you've already compromised an account from somewhere, right? Um, I mentioned we can't get lazy and we can't skip steps. John Strand mentioned that in his, key, in his keynote yesterday. Uh, enumeration, OSINT, and a lot of that recon really becomes infinitely more important when attacking organizations that either have a hybrid environment uh, or are strictly cloud or multi-cloud type of situations. Uh, one tool to help with that specifically for uh, Office 365 is called OO365. I love this tool. Uh, we're going to kind of go into all these tools and commandlets more in depth here uh, in just a bit. So PowerShell is my go-to typically, uh oh, 365. I, I use it on every pen test. Uh, I always find out whether or not a client is using Office 365. You can do that through uh, DNS and domain enumeration. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward or, you know, during your scoping call, you can uh, ask those questions as well. Uh, as far as the PowerShell goes, it's broken down into the AZ module, uh, the MSOL module, which is the Microsoft Online for Office 365. And then Azure AD has its own specific module with its own commandlets as well. Additional modules that are helpful are the SharePoint and Exchange Online module. The Exchange Online, though, is a little bit tricky. Uh, there used to be a restriction where you had to access a specific URL only in Edge in order for that module to uh, download and install correctly. Uh, so keep that in mind. All right, so let's break these down a little bit. We'll start with OO365. I mentioned uh, enumeration uh, and, and finding user accounts is probably the most important exercise you can do. Uh, OO365 uh, helps with this. Um, you know, besides looking through breach data as part of your, your OSINT analysis, uh, this will allow you to test some of the results of your initial OSINT findings on whether or not you've got valid accounts. So why does this work? Well, John Strand also mentioned this yesterday. Uh, Microsoft uh, offers differing application responses uh, during their login process. So you submit a, a username, which is an email address. Um, the application then, uh, your browser then responds, or the application responds in your browser and says, Okay, cool, we're looking for your Microsoft account. Yep, we found it, please enter your password as a second step. If you enter a wrong user, it's going to say, sorry, that user is not found uh, in our system or, or something like that. Um, so what that does is that gives us uh, information on whether we've got a valid user account or not. So uh oh 365 takes advantage of this vulnerability, uh, which you know, in my opinion is a application security 101 type of vulnerability uh, that Microsoft doesn't feel is a big deal. So no wonder we're seeing a lot of business email compromise uh, talked about uh, as of late. So uh oh 365 allows you to take a word list of potential usernames. It, it goes through this process of trying to identify whether or not they're valid email addresses, and then it returns to you 
uh, all the email addresses that are valid. You can then save that, output that to a file, and then begin using other tools to perform password spraying attacks against either Office 365 uh, or the uh, Microsoft Online endpoint. Very handy tool. If you haven't used it, I highly recommend checking out. And by the way, pen testers, if, if you want to help your sales team um, validate uh, emails that they've potentially collected for potential clients, this is one way to do that as well. Okay, so we'll go into PowerShell a little bit. Uh, if you're gonna use the PowerShell modules and commandlets and you have the ability to, based on your uh, the, the user context you've compromised, uh, you, you need to authenticate first to establish your PowerShell se session as an authenticated session. Um, I recommend using all three of these commandlets. So you've got an authenticated session to all of these uh, services and you've got access then to all the commandlets from an authenticated point of view. Uh, when you run connect AZ account, connect Azure AD, or connect MSOL service, you'll get greeted with the typical uh, browser login prompt. You put in your username, your password, your multi-factor authentication token if you have it, and then it will your PowerShell um, will uh, display the response back uh, and will show you some, some basic information about your account, uh, the subscription name, the tenant ID, uh, what the uh, cloud environment is named, um, and that's primarily the Connect Azure AD and the Connect AZ account. Connect M MSOL service it doesn't really return anything, uh, but as long as there were no errors, uh, you've got an authenticated session to the Office 365 environment as well. It's important to run all of these because there are some commandlets in the uh, uh, MS Online module that aren't available in the AZ account or the Azure AD modules, I'm um, sorry, the AZ or the Azure AD modules and vice versa. There's some modules available in AZ or Azure AD that aren't available in the others. So in my opinion, it's important to use all three of these <clears throat> uh, to go ahead and, um, uh, you know, uh, establish an authenticated session. All right, so once you're authenticated, what can you do? Well, it's, uh, it's important to enumerate as much information once you're inside the environment. Uh, if those of you familiar with the Offensive Security uh, Certified Professional, the OSCP, uh, pa uh, pen testing with Cali course, um, it's a common uh, motto to hear, enumerate, enumerate, enumerate. Well, enumeration becomes infinitely more important in cloud environments because one, there's so much information out there. Uh, it's important to gather as much of that as possible so that you can uh, make targeted attacks uh, against the environment you're, you're performing a pen test against. So get AZ AD user. Um, this uh, returns all the users in uh, the Azure Active Directory uh, with some information about them. Uh, from there, you can take the user ID and enumerate that user further to see if that's an account you want to then uh, go after and try to get access to. Um, you can, uh, you know, look at your own user account that you have current access to, find what privileges or permissions that user has to the environment, uh, and then run uh, that user ID through some of the other commandlets uh, in the AZ uh, module. Uh, for example, get AZ AD group, get AZ AD group member, that all returns valuable information about group membership, groups that exist, permission levels, and what the purpose of that group is for. All right, now uh, another part of information gathering in, in uh, an Azure tenant is, is getting information about the tenant. What resource groups are available? Uh, what subscriptions are available um, in, in the tenant? Um, you know, do the resource group naming, uh, does the resource group naming convention uh, really highlight uh, what the purpose of that resource group is? Uh, for example, do you see something called example.com dash dev. Well, it's a good bet that there could be some misconfigured services in there running some sort of dev environment for, for application developers. Uh, so again, that could uh, be a good tip off. Um, uh, so I really like just using the tools that, that are available, uh, assuming you've got PowerShell access to, to you know, the environment you're pen testing, uh, but using the tools that are available. So in this case, in this uh, example here on the right side, uh, we're seeing the get AZ resource group run. And what that is doing is returning uh, all the resource group names that are available under the current tenant and subscription level. Um, and then from there, we can enumerate resources that are part of those resource groups by using get AZ resource and providing that uh, resource group ID. 
Uh, so much more, I, obviously, there's not enough time in a single day to cover everything available on the PowerShell, but I highly recommend uh, downloading it if you haven't and playing around with it because uh, there's there's some cool things you could do and obviously a lot of opportunity for automation using the tools. And the reason why I recommend these native tools is, as I've seen since starting with Secure Sky, um, Azure changes what seems like every five to six days um, rendering some of the other tools I was researching uh, ineffective because the tool authors haven't kept those tools up to date. So uh, PowerShell, I find, you know, the PowerShell module changes occur pretty close to when uh, uh, the Azure uh, and Office 365 changes occur. So it's, it's pretty helpful. All right, continuing, now let's move on to the uh, AZ command line tool. Uh, again, if you don't have access to PowerShell, you can do a heck of a lot from uh, the Azure command line tool that they make available. Uh, just like the PowerShell, you need to establish an authenticated session to the environment. Remember, identity is that perimeter into the environment. Um, so to do that, you run AZ login. You're prompted with a, uh, a login prompt. Um, if you're already authenticated on your system, you may have a couple choices, uh, as you see in, in this case here, but um, put in the credentials you've, you've compromised and, and, and go to town. Once you're logged in, you'll get greeted with a window that says, hey, congratulations, you've been logged in. You can close this window, it's really no longer necessary. Um, and then in your terminal or your PowerShell terminal, you'll receive some sort of output, uh, again, similar to the PowerShell modules that, that uh, give you some idea of your user account, what tenant it's a part of, um, and, and you know some information to take to then use in other requests using the AZ command line tool. A very helpful tool. So similar thing, enumerate more information about the tenants, enumerate more information about Azure Active Directory, uh, and the AZ CLI has a bunch of sub commands and sub tools within itself or modules, however you wanna call it, um, in order to do that. Uh, so in this case, uh, we're running AZ resource uh, to get a list of all the resources available under this tenant ID. Um, and when you log in, you're in the context of that current tenant, unless you specifically tell the tool to change tenant context. Uh, so you run AZ resource list and it lists all the resources. You can go through them manually, you can you know, script it uh, somehow, uh, but it's valuable information to, to see what cloud resources are available to that tenant, what cloud resources uh, in Azure, the organization is using, uh, and then you can launch further uh, attacks from there. AZ accounts, AZ security, all those, again, deal with your current user context um, and provide good information uh, to help figure out what you know permission levels you have. Now, once you've identified resources and you want more information about those resources specifically, uh, the AZ CLI tool uh, gives you access to interrogate those cloud services specifically uh, or to manage and administer them um, from the command line. Uh, so for in the previous example, we saw um, uh, like a network group. Um, you know, if, if we had identified virtual machines, we could run the AZ VM tool to interrogate that virtual machine and, and maybe get more information that could be useful to launch attacks against it. For instance, does the virtual machine have a public facing IP address? Okay, if, if I miss that in my enumeration from, uh, for whatever uh, aspect, uh, that gives me uh, an actual IP address, then I could hit with, with what I would call traditional pen testing uh, methodology and, and, and go through that process of seeing any weaknesses uh, on the internet facing side of that VM. Now, I don't know what everybody's experience with cloud, but, but the deeper I dive into cloud environments, the more assessments I, I do, um, the, the more I realize there, there's a big disparity between um, uh, organization's knowledge of the cloud. It's still kind of this new thing. And in their defense, the, the uh, documentation is pretty far spread out and pretty dispersed, uh, hard to find, out of date, things like that. Um, what I find is a lot of organizations are taking their on-prem environment and then moving it to the cloud and essentially spinning up virtual machines in the cloud. So they're almost using the cloud as a, a new hypervisor environment. Um, instead of taking advantage of some of the serverless, quote unquote, serverless infrastructure that's available. And I see this a lot with application environments. Um, and, and I think, um, I'm hoping that's going to change the more that, that us as pen testers or us as application security assessors uh, perform these assessments and we get the knowledge uh, I, I'm hoping to see that mature. Uh, I like what John Strand said yesterday about 
Um, uh, you know, you want to see your clients make your job harder. Absolutely. Uh, I can tell uh, one experience of a client at, at, at my last gig, who every time we pen tested them, we had very little repeat findings. And it was awesome to see because it definitely made our job a heck of a lot harder. Um, and, and those are the fun clients because it's, it's something new. It changes up the monotony of, of testing the same environment over and over again. And, and it really uh, shows that you've got a partnership with your clients and you know, they're not just trying to check a box off on a compliance checklist. And there's nothing wrong if you need to check boxes, I get it. That's just how it is sometimes. Um, but uh, it's really enjoyable when you see uh, clients embrace your recommendations. The only way they can do that though, is if you're selling that recommendation well, and if you're, you're basing that recommendation in, in foundational best practices. In order to do that as pen testers, we have to educate ourselves. We have to have that knowledge, live on the bleeding edge sometimes of understanding uh, risk management in these, in these new technologies or newer technologies or maturing technologies, and, and that's a way to do it. Um, so back on topic, off my soapbox, uh, interrogating services is, is very easy with the uh, AZ command line tool um, and uh, the help menus provide a lot of robust, verbose information uh, to understand how to use each of them. Uh, some of the services that I think are important to evaluate are, are obviously the, the key vault service, um, identity uh, service, so Azure uh, Active Directory especially, um, disk and storage, uh, all those you know could potentially have uh, sensitive or confidential data that, that uh, are critical to the organization you're assessing, hence could be a um, uh, potentially higher critical risk uh, finding. Um, so really interrogating those services, especially Key Vault, if their modern applications are actually using Key Vault properly and not you know, embedding or hard coding API keys and API secrets in their code, um, making sure their Key Vault service uh, doesn't have any glaring exploitable weaknesses is, is a, a good thing to check on a, on a pen test and the AZ command line tool and PowerShell make that super easy. So as you can see here, here we're looking at uh, the AZ disk service. Um, it allows you to see information like, hey, is this disk encrypted? How big is this disk? Is this disk associated with a, a virtual machine? Some of this information you can get from the AZ VM uh, uh, interrogation as well. Um, but uh, it's, it's always good to have multiple views of, of the different services, uh, again, to gather as much information as possible. Now, the exercise for us as pen testers is it becomes infinitely more important to understand how to filter that data down so you're not overloaded, you're not taking too much time um, going through that data. I do recommend obviously taking a little more time just to make sure you don't miss anything, uh, but uh, it's important to filter it filter that data down uh, considerably since there's so much of that data, especially for large organizations that are, are multi-tenant or multi-cloud environments. Okay, we made it this far. Congratulations. Uh, let's take a deep breath. I know that was kind of uh, drinking from a fire hose or a fire hydrant in this case, um, but now we're going to move on to AWS. <clears throat> One thing about AWS, uh, I think AWS has had a little bit more time to mature their, uh, their product than Azure, uh, but I think Azure is moving more quickly than AWS currently in, in, in maturing theirs. Uh, so it's definitely becoming a battle, but one thing with AWS, they have a robust API. Um, AWS, um, if I recall, um, kind of got its roots in being uh, the cloud service provider for modernized applications, right? It had a really heavy uh, application focus uh, for, for robust enterprise level applications where, where I kind of see Azure as being more, hey, we want to kind of handle your IT needs uh, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, on-prem stuff. Just, just let us handle all the infrastructure and, and whatnot. Uh, so with that in mind, it's important to understand that when you're approaching AWS, you almost have to have a slightly different mindset um, in, in, in really kind of pay attention to, to the application security type of um, uh, setup for AWS uh, when performing a pen test. Now, that's not to say organizations couldn't use AWS for virtualizing, you know, um, servers and, and whatnot. Obviously, EC2 instances are a big part of AWS. Um, in my experience, which I will admit is limited to only a few years, um, it, it, I see a lot more applications being spun up in AWS and a lot more, you know, um, 
Active Directory environments naturally moving to Azure. Uh, so it's important to kind of keep that uh, keep that in mind as you're uh, as you're performing your assessments. So some tools that work well with AWS, the AWS tools for Windows are awesome. Uh, it comes with a PowerShell module uh, with a bunch of commandlets, and uh, AWS has also uh, released a software development kit for the .NET framework. Um, all that's very helpful if you have a strong development background. Lots of potential for tool development there. Lots of potential for for really making some uh, some cool things happen. I love the PowerShell modules, um, but when it kind of comes down to it, I'm more of a fan of the AWS command line uh, tool, uh, just because it's it's been around for a while. It's uh, on a lot of blogs. If if you have questions on how to use it, um, uh, really cool. Uh, a recent tool that I've stumbled upon, it's not new by any stretch of the imagination, but a recent tool I've stumbled upon is the uh, Paku tool by Rhino Security Labs. Really cool tool. Uh, hats off to the guys there that made it. Um, you know, going along with John Strand's comment about we really need to work together as an industry to propel people forward um, and, and make tools that are useful and kept up to date. This is one of those tools that they've done a great job uh, keeping up to date and it's very useful. Uh, it's very modulistic if you're used to Metasploit or, or similar um, attack frameworks, uh, but it's geared towards AWS. So with that said, um, we're still doing good on time. With that said, let's cover some of the tools. So again, like some of the Azure tools with AWS, you need to authenticate and establish the session. Uh, unlike Azure, where you're using a username, a password, and a um, multi-factor authentication one-time token, if that's configured, uh, AWS uses API keys and, and API secret keys uh, for access, or sorry, access keys and access secrets. And, and so set AWS credential does that. You, you pass the access uh, secret and the access key using command line arguments. And then suddenly your, your current session is, is running under the context of that user uh, and running authenticated. Once you do that, um, uh, just like Azure, it's important to kind of uh, understand your current permissions, where, you, where your user you've compromised falls within the, the gamut of the AWS environment, what kind of access that user has. Uh, typical things you would do on a pen test if you compromise a user trying to figure out what can you do with, with these credentials. Um, uh, IAM is, is a, Amazon's identity and access management service. Uh, and so if you need uh, information about your current user, uh, get IAM user uh, helps with that. If you need to list all the users, get IAM user list uh, commandlet in, in its options uh, helps with that. Uh, some of these, um, not necessarily the IAM tools, but, but some of the service related tools, as we'll see, we'll, we'll need to um, uh, establish which region we want to check in, right? Amazon, Amazon like Azure is broken out into uh, different regions. So East, East 2, West, West 2, things like that. All right, so this next image is a uh, get IAM group for user. So again, once you're authenticated, this is obviously what you want to see on a pen test. If uh, this is your first user that you get, you want to see that they're part of the admins group and that they can you know, pretty much run the gamut on uh, services and in, 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 you know, uh, what you can do with that user potential. Th this is almost like the, um, almost like the domain admin for, for AWS. Not that domain admin should be your end goal, but um, it's, it's usually a goal of a lot of pen tests uh, and then seeing, you know, what we can do, you know, whether we get domain admin or not, what can we do to identify sensitive data to the organization that they would consider a pretty, a pretty big risk. So IAM uh, uh, commandlets help you enumerate permissions, policies, things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, EC2 uh, commandlets, uh, again, help you uh, handle the virtual machines that the organization has stood up <clears throat> in, uh, uh, in AWS. Uh, so get EC2 instance, um, you know, things like that help uh, identify um, uh, virtual machines and, 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 and whatever. So something that's interesting, the get EC2 password data, um, very cool module in PowerShell if you've got the correct access level. Uh, this will actually uh, retrieve the password hashes from the, <laughs> from the configured virtual machine. I laugh because it's, you know, as I'm working on uh, handling some internal security stuff at work, it, it's, uh, 
Uh, some of these modules are becoming even more useful. Uh, but EC2 password data dumps the password hash data from, from the uh, service uh, in your PowerShell environment, again, if you've got the per permissions to do so. And, uh, um, you know, you could then take that from there and, and see what you can do with it. Uh, <clears throat> if EC2 instances have public IP addresses, similar to the Azure uh, VMs, um, that's something that's good to know, you know, because now we have another attack vector against those EC2 instances where we don't necessarily need identity. Uh, or maybe we could use that identity if they're running SSH or uh, um, RDP, hopefully not, uh, over uh, open over the public internet. Um, so uh, all this information is, is very handy to have. And as you can see, a lot of these tools are focused more on information gathering. Um, some of these tools can be used to then administer uh, the specific service or alter the settings or pull data from, from the settings. Um, so it's important that we understand there's kind of a dual purpose with some of these tools. Uh, we've all heard of leaky buckets and S3 buckets. Um, you know, unfortunately in, in pen tests, I still find these around, um, especially in older environments uh, where they may have gone unnoticed. Uh, but PowerShell commandlets exist in the Amazon uh, PowerShell module uh, for interrogating buckets, finding the access control list with the buckets, uh, getting information about the objects within the buckets, reading the objects within the buckets, and determining or setting or unsetting encryption um, in the bucket. So again, all these tools just helping you to gather um, uh, information. Another cool tool that I don't have listed here uh, is the access analyzer. Uh, so it takes the current context of your user and essentially scans the environment uh, and analyzes the kind of access you have. Um, so it can be used for, for good things for teams securing their environment, but obviously it can be used by malicious actors as well. That's uh, again, just a plethora of awesome information um, about that AWS environment. So something to keep in mind uh, to check if you have access to that as well. <clears throat> All right, Lambda services, Lambda functions, if, if the environment is hosting a modernized application, um, obviously seeing what you can do or gather from uh, Lambda services is, is awesome uh, to identify or possibly reverse engineering uh, the application that's running. Um, uh, these PowerShell commandlets uh, offer a plethora of information with, with several options to, to go ahead and do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the LM policy, um, you know, again, relates to kind of a security configuration for the Lambda service and, and what kind of access policies were there. So uh, very helpful. Uh, network security groups are good uh, to interrogate. Uh, VPCs are good to interrogate. Um, here's an example of, of uh, the policy um, output here on the right. All right, so continue with AWS. Let's move on to the AWS CLI, which is my preferred method to assess an AWS environment uh, from the command line at least. Um, like the PowerShell modules and like Azure, you need to configure uh, some sort of authentication mechanism. Uh, so in this case, AWS configure prompts you for your access key and your access secret, and then allows you to configure your command line environment uh, specifically for this tool uh, on whether or not you want to focus on a specific region. So if you just want to focus on US-East-1 or US-East-2, um, or uh, change your output from JSON to some other format, um, this is how you go about doing that. Now, um, instead of running this from the command line, you can um, actually navigate to the AWS uh, tool wherever it's installed, <coughs> excuse me, and update the credential file. So unfortunately, the downside of, of running this command is it stores those credentials uh, on the, um, uh, in the user's home folder um, in a uh, .AWS folder uh, inside of a flat text file uh, that's, can, you know, syntaxed in a certain way. So if you're doing a pen test and you happen to be an on-prem pen test and gain access to a developer's uh, laptop somehow, um, you know, the .AWS folder is, should be one that you search for uh, to see if there's some sort of uh, command line credentials configured that you can use then uh, to, to laterally move from the on-prem environment into the AWS environment. So uh, very helpful uh, to know that as well. If you're just using the tool, um, AWS configure will will write those uh, configuration files for you, but there's a whole write up on Amazon uh, documents um, 
about how to add additional configuration settings uh, as, as global configurations. <clears throat> Once you're authenticated, um, the uh, IAM uh, sub module within the AWS command line tool is very helpful. Uh, so here we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking at the get login profile. Um, uh, and and uh, or this might be get account summary. I didn't make notes, sorry about that. It's one of them. Um, but it, it's essentially uh, outputting information about, um, uh, you know, the, the login environment for AWS users, how many policies there are, um, how many uh, groups there are, uh, things like that, uh, how many total users there are. Uh, very helpful information, again, when you're trying to figure out if I don't have the access I need now, give me information about IAM and, and go from there. Find additional access, try to, um, you know, break into additional accounts in order to, to, to propel your pen test forward. All these are very helpful. <clears throat> So here's the uh, get, this one's the get login profile. This is about your current user. Um, uh, when it was created, your user ID, the username, the path they have access to within the organization, the ARN GUID, uh, or sorry, the ARN uh, identifier. And uh, all this then can be used as options or arguments to other tools. Uh, so very, very, very good to, to keep that going. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, EC2, again, the, the command line tool just allows you to interact with any of the services. If you need uh, valuable information from the services, uh, the uh, output here is from running the get password data against an EC2 instance. Uh, so again, if you've got those admin credentials and you need uh, to figure out how to get into a specific EC2 instance, because that's where the client has told you the, the super juicy, saucy data lives, um, then this would be a very helpful tool to, to get that information and then start attacking the uh, password and user account against the uh, EC2 instance itself. Describe instances and describe VPCs helps with kind of the overarching um, large scale setup of the cloud environment. Uh, if the organization has multiple virtual private cloud environments, each with their own subnets and their own virtual networks and network security groups, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all that is is just valuable information. So a lot of these are are, are still information gathering. Some of them though uh, can be used to attack the uh, actual instance. So here's what the described VPCs output looks like. Hopefully it's big enough to see it. It gives information about um, your CIDR block associated, your public CIDR block associated with the virtual private cloud. Um, and, and again, that's very helpful if you need to identify additional attack services into the environment other than through the uh, Amazon API. <clears throat> and then of course the, the preferred one, which has tons of blog posts written about it, the uh, AWS S3 uh, subcommand with its commands and arguments uh, to list S3 buckets that the user has access to, um, you know, list uh, objects within those buckets. If you've got the permissions to sync uh, uh, objects between the bucket and your local host to then manually review the data a uh, very, very helpful tool. And if you're participating in the capture of the flag, I'm, I might just say you may be using this tool for a few of the challenges that I built, just, you know, FYI. Not that I'm giving hints, but FYI. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about Paku because um, this has been a, a recent discovery of mine. I'm not an expert at it by any stretch of the imagination, but I love it because the help, <laughs> The help uh, menu is extremely detailed and it's very helpful to uh, make sure you're, you're running the commands correctly and the modules correctly. So again, this is a modulistic type of attack framework for uh, AWS. Uh, Apaku, if, if you're not familiar, is a fish often found in um, uh, rainforest type uh, water sources. We've got a few at the Henry Billy Zoo. They're those big piranha looking fish that you know look like they could eat a small child. Uh, very, very cool tool. Um, and uh, I think I had the GitHub repo up. If not, I will uh, get that to you guys if you if you want that. Um, so some of the recon modules, uh, again, once you've configured it to use the set of credentials you've compromised, and that's an important first step to understanding pen testing uh, any cloud environment, is once you've compromised an account, where do you go from here? So some of the recon modules, help you enumerate some of the rules that exist in IAM 
um, help you identify buckets that, that may be misconfigured, uh, S3 buckets that are misconfigured, um, help you enumerate uh, the users, their permissions, um, your current users' permissions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then even more enumeration modules, um, you know, how to enumerate accounts in, in the IAM. Um, in this case, we're, <clears throat> we're enumerating uh, quite a bit of uh, EC2 information um, uh, from all of the regions that uh, are, you know, uh, most of the regions that I would have access to with my account in AWS, right? So in this, in this example, you see that this account would have uh, 39 total uh, instances for EC2 instances. So that would be a lot of uh, additional uh, possibly attack vectors for, for you to interrogate uh, as you're going through it, uh, through the pen test. <clears throat> Okay, uh, privilege escalation, right? So if you're not a privileged user, have no fear. Rhino Security Labs uh, put in a privilege escalation module, um, IAM underscore underscore privesc underscore scan, uh, which kind of takes the guesswork out of it for you. A uh, very smart bunch of, of, of individuals there who, you know, you know, made this module to really look at your current permissions, how things are configured, your current policies that are attached to your user account, uh, things like that. Um, uh, again, just very helpful for uh, escalating your privileges inside of that um, AWS environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they've also got, also got lateral movement. So again, in a multi virtual private cloud type of situation uh, within AWS, um, identifying ways to you know, move into other, other virtual private clouds um, you know, that you may or may not have, have permissions to, uh, to um, you know, cloud trail, uh, lateral movement, uh, th things like that. These are very service specific, uh, but again, can be very helpful in, in certain situations. Uh, and then of course, if there's uh, weaknesses in, in other services like EBS or API Gateway, um, there's actually exploitation modules that these, these uh, um, that Rhino Security Labs has built into this tool. And they keep it up to date. I, I think the last update I saw was only like a month ago. Um, so they, they keep it fairly up to date. Um, which is good and why I, I recommend getting familiar with this tool uh, for assessing AWS environments. Now, one thing I did notice, uh, the S3 bucket finder, um, you know, I did some testing before the talk to see if the, you know, CTF challenges I configured that may involve S3 buckets. Um, uh, you know, I, I made one specifically for this talk with a domain that I owned just to see if it would find it. And even though DNS is propagated properly, it, it's not quite finding it um, uh, quite a bit. So I'm not sure if it's a configuration issue on my, on my end or a bug in, in PACU, but uh, all the other modules that I've tested so far have worked uh, really, really well. Okay, so we're running short on time here, uh, but uh, I wanna kind of do um, a quick overview of Google Cloud Platform. There really isn't a whole lot to talk about on GCP. Uh, there's just not a lot of tools that, that are out there. Um, they do have a, a software development kit. Um, and uh, you know, that is helpful. That comes with the command line tool. Um, but what they've done is they've kind of taken the developer approach to a whole nother extreme. And they've released a bunch of libraries that work in these tools that I've got listed here. Um, so if, if you're a developer and, and you want to interact um, that, you know, you can definitely develop your own tools to interact with their API. Their API is pretty well documented, um, and it's just a matter of reading it and educating yourself uh, on that. Another tool that is a, a service and unfortunately is paid for is the Cloud Security Scanner, and it, it performs application vulnerability scanning uh, in App Engine in Google Cloud. Um, again, if, you, if your account has access to the results of this, this can kind of save you some time um, depending on how old the results are, but uh, running this could, could definitely save you some time, but also may kind of give away your presence uh, on, uh, in the environment. If, uh, if uh, you're testing their incident response, this may not be a, a very quiet thing to do. Um, so G Cloud Info kind of gives uh, uh, information using the command line tool about the current access in the cloud environment. And then uh, identity and security is, is really kind of where it's at to, to figure out uh, how to go from here uh, with the current access you have. <clears throat> I'm gonna go through this kind of quick because I do wanna show a quick demo using AWS. Uh, G Cloud Asset, hey, they give you an asset inventory tool. We might as well use it 
uh, to really understand what services are being used uh, in the environment we have access to. And then of course, uh, GCP is really good for uh, hosting applications. And so identifying, uh, identifying some of the data uh, services that are available and seeing if those are misconfigured, um, giving you access to the, the databases or the information inside of them. Um, uh, another good exercise. And of course, um, App Engine and uh, Compute Services um, for, for accessing any of the uh, APIs uh, for any applications that are deployed there. Um, all those are, are very helpful. All right, so miscellaneous tools. Okay, we may not get to the demo, but that's okay. Um, you could see me and I could you know, give you that demo and a friendly talk or something. Um, if you're assessing modern cloud applications, your standard set of tools still works well. A Wasp Zap or Suite Pro. I've discovered Angular Augury is a, a cool tool lately. It's a browser plugin for um, uh, attacking uh, Angular applications. Uh, browser development tool still works really well. And by the way, Angular applications, Burstweet Pro users, Burstweet's not going to have visibility into the Angular. Um, so you're going to need to make sure you supplement your testing with browser developer tools. Uh, John talked about this yesterday by Bo Bolak, uh, MSOL Spray um, tool. I haven't had a chance to play with yet, but just looking over the, the GitHub repo and, and the work that Bo's done, awesome. Uh, I, I can't wait to, to actually use this on my next assessment, um, especially that, you know, for, for any clients using Office 365 or Azure. Uh, one tool I love to use is PwnDB. Now this does require you to connect uh, a Tor server or to start a Tor service because it's going to go through there to, to uh, access a uh, uh, Onion site of, of breach uh, usernames and passwords. But this is usually one of the first things I do is run it against all the domains I can identify for the organization to see if any of their users were involved in LinkedIn, uh, Dropbox, or any of the other breaches. Uh, John mentioned Recon NG yesterday as well. I know it's an older tool, but it's still kept up to date and well developed. Um, Landmaster is doing an awesome job with that, and uh, it's still very helpful as a, another way to identify um, exposed uh, passwords and usernames in previous breaches. And then Ruler, uh, Ruler was, uh, you know, you can use this on on-prem exchange environments to make malicious rules that then, um, you know, execute uh, shellcode. Uh, it also works for Office 365. Um, I haven't used it yet for an Office 365 assessment, but I have used it successfully for an on-prem exchange uh, assessment, and uh, um, it, uh, it's a great tool. <clears throat> Just make sure you clean it up. You know, mail forwarding rules in Office 365 is, is another uh, weakness that malicious actors are abusing uh, as part of business email compromise, so it's important that we, we, we test for that kind of stuff as well. And then, of course, uh, for Azure AD, PowerZure is a good one. And then uh, your typical domain information, whatever you like to use. I, I just use DNS Dumpster, DNS Recon, and Whois as, as uh, some of the enumeration I do. Uh, but uh, again, we cannot skip that phase of the attack anymore. It's very important information uh, that, to help us identify whether clients are, are using cloud services or not. And then, of course, every platform has their own AB API, their own web console and portal. Uh, sometimes just logging into that is, is helpful and just kind of navigating around all the services that they may have configured. Um, AWS and Azure do their best to make it easy to find things, but, you know, they've got so many different things coming at you. Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, so use that search feature often. Um, Google Cloud, um, you know, again, they've got a, a web console and a web portal to, to manage environments that way. So if you've got the access with the account credentials you've compromised, then uh, that's a way to go. Okay, I want to save some time for questions. Um, so we'll, we'll skip the demo since it's uh, six minutes to the end of the talk here. Uh, hi, Jason. Hello, Michael. Great talk. Um, Thanks, Ben. Very interesting for you know for someone like me from the red team perspective, um, but also we've, we've got a number of questions, including some from kind of the blue team perspective. So I think it was great. Sure, we had sure. some had some good discussion and, and thoughts. Um, I was curious uh, to start off. You know, in your experience uh, doing your your pen test, what is the most common cloud platform right now? Is it still AWS, or, or what are you seeing most out there? Uh, Office three sixty five. Yeah, <clears throat> that that's uh, that has come up in every single pen test I've, I've, I've done. Um, and in, in, in situations where there's multi-cloud situations, it's usually Office 365, 
which comes with SharePoint, comes with Azure AD and Teams. Um, and then uh, organizations will run their applications in AWS. And so, you know, having that knowledge, you've got so much to look at, right? So right. If, you're, if you're thinking from an internal pen test perspective, you've not only got the internal network, you've got the Office 365 environment, you've got the AWS environment. And once you compromise an account, it's usually not a matter of if, but when nowadays, uh, once you compromise an account, man, it's, it's like, okay, game on. What, what can we do either on-prem on or in the cloud? What's going to be more impactful for uh, risk uh, um, you know, management for the organization that we're assessing? Right, very good. Um, so Jake asks if, if you have any tips for limiting who can query users and roles in Azure AD as if uh, if a player get or if a player if a user gets popped, uh, what can be done to prevent the attacker from logging into the portals or CLI and exporting all users groups roles? Yeah, so so that's a good question, Jake. First off and foremost, uh, we want to stop the perimeter. We want the first layer of defense to be the perimeter. So we want to make sure that um, multi-factor authentication is enforced that any uh, tokens, multi-factor authentication tokens have a limited lifespan. We want to prevent users from um, using apps, uh, using legacy authentication, because remember, all it is is like a string of 12 characters and nothing else for that legacy authentication. So we want to disable that. Uh, and we also want to make sure that um, we don't allow users to register their own apps. We don't allow users to um, uh, click yes on, hey, trust this device, uh, because that adaptive multi-factor authentication suddenly blows your trust model out of the water and allows users to make that decision. And that's not really a, a decision we want users to make. Then from there, we still want to use the principle of least privilege inside of Azure AD. And specifically, we want to prevent users from using PowerShell um, to, to um, connect to Azure AD. And a big one by default, all users can log into the uh, admin portal for Azure. Um, and even though they can't muck with the settings, they could read all of the settings. So disabling that setting in, in Azure AD is a big one as well. And I think that one's done through the Office 365 admin portal to do that. Um, so, you know, again, just use your common sense. Privilege, uh, principal least privilege still comes into effect uh, in Office environment, in Azure environments and cloud environments. Right. Um, let's see if we can get one more quick one in uh, from, the, from the blue team side. So um, do you have any good detection tips for blue teamers to detect these tools or make them less effective? And on the same note, someone said, what would you look for in the unified audit log to detect a password spraying attack? Yeah, so um, let me answer the first question first. Um, we, we're, as a company, uh, really getting excited about Microsoft Sentinel, which is essentially the um, cloud SIM product for Azure, um, specifically because of its capabilities. So Microsoft um, has Security Center, which has a lot of dashboards that gives a lot of good information. You know, are you complying with PCI? Here's services that are not. Are you complying with CIS? Um, do you have risk in your environment? Things like that. Sentinel kind of integrates with all of that, but it offers you a SIM platform for the cloud that works with uh, our syslog, it works with syslog standard, uh, works with logic apps, it, it can ingest Salesforce and other SaaS applications and really kind of wrangle that into a central place. Um, not that I'm giving a sales pitch, but you know, we're, we're kind of building on top of that and, and coming out with something to centralize it even more that constantly assesses risk in your environment and gives you ways to integrate fixes on the spot to kind of automate the tier one, tier two SOC type of uh, tasks that you know your SOC or your NOC might have. When it comes to logs and password spraying, uh, you want to look at um, Microsoft's got some identifiers such as uh, you know, hey, this user is logging in for multiple IP addresses. So that's something you want to turn on to see who's logging in, uh, because Microsoft will uh, almost heuristically look at patterns of logging in for user accounts and, and collect that data. Uh, if you tell it to, and we'll identify as like, hey, is Bob really in China right now where it's two in the morning trying to log in? Right. And is Susie really in Seattle when she's normally in, in Europe? Um, and, and it will uh, alert on that type of, of uh, information, um, which will help in, in kind of deterring or detecting some of those password spray attacks. 
All right, great. Thank you. And I hate to cut you off, but we got to jump into the next talk. Thanks, everybody. Uh, if you can, jump in the hallway, answer questions, and people are asking for your slides. Okay, we'll do. All right, thanks, man. You did great.